Ready? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Hi there. My name is Melina. Hey, Melina. Hey, Jeff. Hello to all our listeners. Today, we're all recording from home, so don't be alarmed if you hear a siren in the background. They're not coming for us just yet. I am working in digital communications at Bosch, meaning that I'm taking care of, well, pretty much everything that has to do with social media and the development of new digital formats. So, well, talking about digital, as Jeff already mentioned, we record remotely today and I'm sitting in my home office slash gym room. And I only see Jeff via video conference call, which is such a shame because I'd love to see you in person and talk to you in person. But, well... Yeah, absolutely. My name is Jeff Kostaitis. I spent my career so far in the IT division where we make sure all the bits and bytes keep flowing by providing all sorts of products and services to all the Bosch divisions so we can live up to our promise of being invented for life. So everyone, welcome to another episode of... From Know How... To wow, the Bosch Global Podcast. Let me ask you this. How do you feel about cars? Do you always want to have the newest and the fanciest? Huh, well, um, to be honest, I'm, well, not that passionate about cars, to be honest, which is probably kind of odd considering that, well, I'm living in a city that revolves around cars pretty much. Um, but while there are certain aspects that I can be thrilled about, let's let's say like that. I mean, I like a great and clean design. I, I like a convenient car, especially well, when being on long haul drives. Um, and well, yeah, I, I can be passionate about horsepower as well, to be honest. It's, it's no secret that gearheads all over the world are fascinated by the electronics in modern cars. Every model year, we're seeing more and more advanced technology. But have you ever wondered What's the most old-fashioned part of a modern car? Mm -hmm. Most old-fashioned part? Um, well, not really. Um, I'm not sure I can think of anything in a car that, well, looks like it did just a few decades ago. Everything, everything pretty much is digital now. Well, yes, certainly a lot, but also not all. I actually was asking around the gym the other day what people thought the oldest unchanged part of a car is. Of course you did that at the gym. <laughs> what component of a car has changed the least over the last hundred years? Seat. What part of the car has changed the least in the last hundred years? Gas cap. What part of the car has changed the least in the last hundred years? Back mirror. Only the design changed. Nothing else. Steering wheel, probably the uh, exhaust. The wheel? Wheels. The wheel? <laughs> what part of the car has changed the least in the last hundred years? The driver. <laughs> Great, I love that. Why didn't I come up with that? <laughs> but for most parts, they, they named, they did in fact change quite a bit over the last hundred years. Car seats these days have heaters and even massagers now. Mm. Uh, new generations of rearview mirrors use cameras, and the steering wheel is full of multimedia controls. But they didn't think of the one thing inside the car that's sometimes right in front of our eyes. Right in front of my eyes? Literally. The win windshield wiper? No, that doesn't make any sense. So what are you talking about? <laughs> the sun visor. Oh, yeah, makes sense, right? Right? Yeah. Now, I don't know if it's indeed the one part that's most similar to what it looked like 100 years ago, uh, but it's certainly up there in the top contenders. <sighs> well, yeah, perhaps. Um, <laughs> to be honest, isn't that like also the, the most boring part of a car? Nah, I don't know about that. Uh, later on, I'll show you how Bosch engineers are working to reinvent the sun visor. And for our gadget fans, yes, the sun visor is getting electrified yes! and it's getting a computer <laughs> of its own. But I think we should first appreciate the sun visor as it is. As we saw, we hardly ever even think about it. But when we use it, it's pretty important to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously it helps you when you're blinded by the sun. Which makes it a safety feature and a convenience issue for sure. Obviously, it's pretty unpleasant to have a flood of all this intense light directly in your eyes. And the impact of light really deserves a little bit of reflection, don't you think, Melina? Mm-hmm, absolutely. I mean, I can also think of one situation where people seem to enjoy a blast of light. It 
think light is a very powerful tool, as, as audio is. This is Mark Brickman. Mark is a lighting artist, and he even was nominated for an Emmy due to his work. He does lighting for stage shows, among other things, so you might have seen some of his work. I started with Bruce Springsteen back in <laughs> 1972, went on to work with Pink Floyd from 79, the original Wall, through present day, still work with Pink That's Floyd. That's incredible. <laughs> and I, my company, our artist collective we have here in Los Angeles, one of our installations is the Empire State Building oh, for wow. the past eight years. Well, yeah, I, I got goosebumps. I mean... So he knows a thing or two about bright lights. You could say that. There are these uh, especially bright lights at concert um, that are not illuminating the stage, but they're directed at the audience. And and when you're when you're close enough, if you're lucky enough to have have uh, upfront spots, I mean, you can really feel the heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's why they're called uh, the audience blinders. <laughs> I didn't know that. That fits. That fits very, very well. And Mark also knows why blinding people can be a nice turn and how this audience blinders came to fame. They started as audience lights. So in the 80s, when um, they would record the shows for broadcast, they always wanted to light up the audience. So what you had then is you had two different, let's say, disciplines coming into a head-on collision course, which were the TV people that always wanted <laughs> to light everything up because And they needed light everywhere. Mm, yeah, it makes sense. And then they would run into someone like myself who had crafted a dramatic theatrical show with cues and darkness played a big part. And so there'd be a head-on collision. <laughs> so, the, so, that's, so we would come to some sort of compromise so that they could see the audience, maybe not after every song, mm -hmm. but they would see them at different times. Well, then um, apparently at some point, somebody must have noticed that these audience blinders, when they come on, they can really help get the audience excited. Some uh, lighting designers say that it's a surefire way to make everyone throw their arms in the air. Um, Mike Brickman, um, on the other hand, wouldn't go that far, but he knows that audience blinders definitely have an effect. Used tastefully and with thoughtful precision, it's very effective being, well, what I would call the icing on the cake. In other words, the cake is the performance. The icing would be that mm -hmm. extra boost that brings in the last people at the very back of the stadium because you've reached out to them not only with the audio, but with lighting and at specific times when you really want to climax. Yeah. Yeah. That extra boost. Exactly. I've definitely experienced that. And and it is it is somehow energizing. There's a, there's a movie, which is not exactly recent, but it talks about taking a concert up to 11. And I think uh, some of our listeners will recognize uh, the reference of, well, why not just make 10 louder? Well, it's 11. <laughs> and I think <laughs> that's definitely in the same <laughs> spirit. Um, and that, that reminds me of, of uh, the last concert I saw, which was uh, a heavy, heavy metal show. And Man, all I can say is the light show alone was worth the price of the ticket. But, but we should also say, um, Mike Brickman is not the biggest fan of these audience blinders. Oh, is that still about the illuminated audience things? Is he is he holding a grudge from the 80s? <laughs> he's the most unforgiving person. <laughs> 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 nah, well, he says darkness is an important part of lighting design. And, and okay. I like the way of thinking. Audience blinders are, well, kind of overused in his opinion. I find the EDM shows probably to be the biggest, you know, it's just out in the audience the whole time. And wow, I, I wouldn't want to go to that show. I mean, I've been there and I find it to mm -hmm. be abusive. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, another name that lighting designers use for audience blinders is audience abuse. <laughs> that uh, that term sounds sounds pretty accurate. I was at an EDM show in Chicago a couple years ago, and yeah, I left that show feeling abused. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah, you got to experience but, but yeah. it. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. So just to make that point, I think being dazzled can sometimes be enjoyable. It can energize you. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's got to be short bursts. No one wants mm -hmm. this glaring light in their face the whole time, which yeah, actually uh, brings us back to the point of trying not to look at the bright light. 
we're back with our wonderful sun visors, right? Yes, exactly. Mm, so you said earlier that the sun visor is being reinvented by Bosch engineers? Yes, my name is Jason Zink. I'm the project lead and one of the co-creators of the virtual visor. Mm -hmm. This is our man, huh? So picture a traditional sun visor. You're sitting in the car and the sun is getting low on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And you're driving directly towards it. That means west. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's definitely like a very, very unpleasant feeling. Um, kind of have to move around in the seat, leaning back and forth. I have to squint my eyes and just really try to see what's right in front of me. Yeah, and you can't look as far ahead as you would like to. Yeah. And it can be hard to get a sense of what's really going on in the road in front of you. Mm -hmm. And so, like, let's say you're you're nearing a traffic light, but it, the with the glare of the light behind it, it can be tough to see mm -hmm. if it's green or red. What do I do? I flip down my sun visor, which is what I should have done a minute ago, probably. Uh, Maybe a little earlier, couldn't have hurt. Uh, but but now you're you're more comfortable, but you've also obstructed your view even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I cannot really see more. It's rather that I can see less, because of course the sun visor is blocking the sun, but it also blocks the view of everything else. And that is exactly where Jason Zink comes in. For our current prototypes, the visor itself is rectangular in shape. It's, I would say, similar to the same width as a current visor. It's slightly taller. And it's transparent. It's basically a glass pane. Oh. Uh, and it's got some fine black lines in it, which form a pattern. And so it's basically kind of a honeycomb structure that you see within this rectangular form. Mm -hmm. And each, each hexagon in that honeycomb shape, we can selectively control whether it's, it's opaque or transparent or also it can be grayscale in between. Okay, cool. So did I understand that correctly? It's mostly transparent, but some of these hexagonal areas can be turned dark so that they block the light? It's genius, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, also, the segments automatically turn dark wherever the glaring light is coming from. So cool. How did they come up with this? Well, like so many great inventions, serendipity. <laughs> can we have that car sound again? Ryan Todd, another Bosch colleague, was on his way to a meeting with Jason Zing. In fact, it was, uh, it was an innovation meeting they were planning. And in his car, Ryan was thinking about something entirely different. Then he needed a new TV set. <laughs> you know, as engineers do, they're thinking about all the different options and what's the pros and the cons. And he was comparing the two types of TVs, which are, you know, more or less the, the available ones, comparing organic... LED, so o OLED, with LCD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the main difference is that OLED pixels are making their own light. Fun fact, for those that don't know, LED means light-emitting diode. Whereas LCD screens utilize a backlight, and the pixels in front of the light source can either let the light through or block it. So anyway, that's on Ryan Todd's mind as he's driving east to the innovation meeting this morning, looking into the sun. Let's have a look to the video where Ryan himself tells us about the moment when the big idea hit him. One day, I was driving to work right into the sunrise. It was blinding me. So I pulled down my sun visor, but then it blinded me. I wondered, why is it that almost everything in a car has advanced amazingly in the past hundred years, except this? Then the big idea hit me. I ran straight to our weekly innovation meeting to share it. <laughs> so smart. I love it. Yeah, that, that was the beginning of the whole thing. So he came to the innovation meeting that day, and we've been working on it together ever since. Applying something from one field, so TV screens are displays, to something entirely different. Yeah. And so basically the, the virtual visor is a transparent display that a computer is able to darken in certain areas just by providing a small electric current. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, here's another fun fact. With LCD screens like that one, they're by default opaque or dark when the electricity is switched off. And then when you apply a current to it, then they become transparent. How many of these fun facts do you have today? <laughs> Well, I like fun. No, it's, so. it's very good to know, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for all our listeners, uh, please check out the show notes. We added some more interesting stuff in there, such as the short clip we just listened to. 
Uh, well, Jeff, with all of your fun facts, can you also tell me more about that computer? How does it know which of these honeycomb segments need to be dark and which ones should be transparent? Yeah, so the way they're doing it is they're using a little bit of a, an artificial intelligence as an enabler for their core algorithm. And if you're schooled in that area, it's it's pretty basic stuff. I can't say I am. But anyway, <laughs> the, the camera is, am is looking at the driver. Well, but that's what we have the experts for. So, <laughs> so the camera is looking at the driver and a traditional computer vision system first finds the driver's face in the camera stream. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that shouldn't be too hard though, right? I mean, because the driver of a car can only be in so many places. Right, but that's that's the start. And again, there's uh, some more relatively industry standard AI to identify the features of the oh. face. Okay. It, it, it actually operates very similar to how your uh, filters work for those social media posts you love to do with the little mm -hmm. dog ears and stuff like that, which which basically means the, the machine is able to identify a mouth or a jawline. In, in this case, obviously, the most important part is the eyes. And True. when that's done, it gets a little more tricky. And then from there, we have what I'll call a, a custom algorithm, which does the illumination analysis and tries to understand in the current lighting environment whether there's a shadow cast through the visor. And um, as you drive around, of course, the lighting environment changes quite a bit. All right. Yeah, of course. Of course it does. Yeah. And it's it's much more than just sun or no sun. Mm -hmm. uh, Everything in your field of view is either reflecting sunlight or their light sources themselves. So the headlights of the cars, for example, and of course then you have obstructions to light sources. So if you're driving past a building and it's blocking the sun, uh, but then very suddenly it's bright again when the sun comes back into view. That means that the system has to understand all of these potential changes of the environment. Yes, and do it all simultaneously. If you're driving down the road and you're passing a bunch of trees, then you have really kind of almost random turning on and turning off of, of that type of light. So that that's, you know, something that, that we have to detect and be able to compensate for. And on the on the ambient light side, you actually have even even more sources of like variation. So when when you're driving, if a white car passes you, then that will have a very different ambient a lighting situation than if no car is next to you. Mm -hmm. right. So there's there's really a lot of challenging uh, aspects that you have to you have to try to compensate for in that changing lighting environment and still be able to understand where the shadows are cast. So the system analyzes the light that's reflected off the driver's face and then has to decide whether some shade is needed from the visor. But this isn't the only challenge they had to come through. There really were a lot of situations where we had challenges and we had to learn from maybe not doing things perfectly. For example, there was a situation where we had a, a big demonstration to an automaker and we were trying to prepare our next version of the prototype, which it was much larger and it had uh, you know, custom LCDs. And we, we tried optically bonding uh, this thing, which if you're not familiar with optical bonding, it's basically a type of glue or adhesive that holds uh, an LCD to something else. So in our case, it was a polycarbonate. And we, we tried optically bonding it, but we honestly had never done anything like that before. <laughs> so we, we were working really hard trying to get it ready in time. We put the this this type of glue on the on the display. And it, it turned out that we were using totally the wrong type of, of adhesive. And there was all kinds of bubbles and imperfections. And, you know, it, it just completely did not work. Oh, God. I mean, I, I really like those kind of unexpected problems. And we were right down to the day before this whole uh, demonstration was supposed to happen. I also totally like and appreciate it when people openly talk about problems. I mean, this is pretty much what we're here for, right? I personally don't think that we do that often enough. It's, yeah, well, it's the challenges that we can learn the most of, I think. Did you just say you like unexpected problems? I do. These, these nerve-wracking situations <laughs> pushing you out of your comfort zone. Absolutely. <laughs> so in, in the end, you know, obviously we found out one way not to optically bond. That's, that's one thing. But more importantly, 
when we actually went to the demonstration, we just took our older prototype. So we just took the previous generation. And of course, it wasn't as fancy and it wasn't as refined as, as the one that we had hoped to bring. But we were still able to kind of convey the meaning of what we were trying to do and show them how, you know, the basic idea of how it would function. And uh, it, it turns out that that was, that was more than enough. You know, there was, we had a very good discussion and um, I, I would consider that the demonstration was a success. So to me, that is so cool. I, I yeah. really I appreciate it when people talk about problems, about mistakes, failures, and well, you can see that they come up with a solution because of that challenge that they had. And to me, this is from know how to wow. Yeah, really rise to the occasion. Wow. Yeah. So I would really say that we're at the wow here. Um, yeah. But what actually really blows me away with this, I mean, something so mundane, something so simple as a sun visor has such a potential for innovation. And I I even called it boring before, you remember? <laughs> so, Shame. Sorry for that. I, I take it back. In the right hands, apparently, the simplest thing can be transformed into something that we had no idea could make our yeah. lives better. Yeah, that's that's the cool part. You know, it, it was literally right in front of everyone's eyes. And to be fair, we only recently have the technology to make this possible. But nonetheless, here we are. Had a little bit of serendipity. And even if it's boring, or it was... It's not. No, it's, it's not. not. It's very not. cool. <laughs> So, since we talked about being dazzled and how to avoid it, this kind of, it got me thinking, why is too much light even a problem, or such a problem for our eyes? I mean, why can't we see anything when it's too bright? Why do we have to close our eyes? For example, when we open the curtains in the morning, which is one of the very worst feelings in the world. <laughs> I don't know about that worst feeling. But yeah, uh, an unexpected <laughs> flash of, of morning sun can be uh, unpleasant, to say the least. <laughs> unpleasant. Having to get up <laughs> is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So why is that, though? So I'm guessing and have no way to prove it, but it sure makes sense to me that the if you're asking on an evolutionary basis, that it is going to be a, a reaction that occurred very early, ancient reaction to be protective. Let me introduce you to Ivan Schwab, author of the book Evolution's Witness about the Evolution of Eyes. Okay, so then when he says uh, ancient reaction to be protective, he's talking about protecting the eyes from light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Um, ultraviolet light in, well, specifically, I think. That's the high energy component of the sunlight mm -hmm. that can actually do damage. Yeah. So um, some early creatures, or let's call them our great, 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 great ancestors, needed protection from that and closed their eyes. Well, uh, he did say he was guessing. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> What's known, however... <laughs> I'm not questioning evolution, is... <laughs> by the way. <laughs> <laughs> however, <laughs> what's known is what happens inside your eye when you open those curtains in the morning. It's a glare phenomenon, and the glare is enough to cause you to squint doesn't usually take long to get used to it as the photoreceptor pigments bleach. I'm sorry, they bleach? They bleach. They bleach. Could you <laughs> please explain that? The photoreceptors that are most sensitive are going to be the rods, the ones that are more active for night and day, light rather than color. Cones would fit more with the color. Um, so the rods are probably more sensitive, and those bleach rather quickly, meaning that you wash them out, or at least enough of them, that you have decreased that stimulus. So yes, they bleach. Now, they restore themselves quickly, but uh, it's an adjustment phenomenon. So once they bleach, they begin to restore themselves really rather quickly, astonishingly quickly. But yes, they bleach. Indeed, it's, it's astonishing. Um but it does not explain what makes us squint or close our eyes because of that glare, right? I mean, Ivan Schwab says it, it could be that the signal travels through the optic nerve to the brain, which then decides to send the signal to close the eyelids. But it's also possible that there is some shortcut from the retina to the muscles closing the eyelids, that the brain isn't really involved in this. That's, that's pretty fascinating. There's still so much to discover. And, and that's pretty exciting by itself. 
it's a bit like the virtual visor. There's potential to develop and find out new things and really innovate just mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, remember when we talked to Mark Brickman, the lighting designer? Yep. That made me think back to what it's like being on stage. And the first thing that you notice when you first go on the stage is that incredibly bright light. Yeah. It can yeah, be really sure. difficult to deal with. So I thought I'd ask Ivan Schwab if actors somehow can adapt to that, you know? If, if there's a possibility to train your eyes to not be so sensitive? Well, I'd never thought about that. And I've never looked anything like that up. So to my knowledge, they don't have anything different. But I suspect you adjust to it. If you spend much of your life in northern Norway and you swim in the ocean um, near the Arctic Circle, the first time you get in, it's... It's miserable. I bet. Yeah. But you probably adjust to the point that, oh, yeah, I can get in that. So there's probably an adjustment factor. Um, the eye doesn't work the same way as the skin, though. And so I'm not sure that's uh, analogous, but that would be the first thing that comes to mind. It, it seems uh, mm. it seems strange the idea that you could you could physically train your eye. Mm. Uh, obviously, it's not it's not a muscle exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. It's it's not. Um, but I mean, what, what Ivan just, just mentioned, this example with your skin adjusting to cold temperatures, that leads to something that I find rather fascinating. So light gets through your skin. So when you close your eyes, you still see some light because some light filters through the eyelids. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when, when I close my eyes, uh, I can still see, you know, for I have a fairly bright lamp on. Uh, I can still even with my eyes closed, know where mm -hmm. there's a light source there. That's that's pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, light doesn't just penetrate the eyelids. It penetrates pretty much all of your skin, and our body can sense that light, says Ivan Schwab. Your muscles uh, know that light is coming through the skin. Just for example, your muscles know in the morning as light is beginning to increase in your bedroom, uh, unless you sleep in complete and total darkness all the time, your muscles beneath the skin will know that light is coming in. And as they do, they begin to prepare by releasing glucose, they begin to prepare for the day so that you don't get out of bed with your muscles depleted of glucose. So that it's all done in advance without your knowledge, uh, done unconsciously, so that you're ready for the day. And with that, we went full circle from being dazzled by the sunlight in the morning to your body sensing the rising sun and getting ready. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I got to say, I find it really refreshing when, when Ivan is very clear that uh, he just doesn't know some things. Mm, yeah. There are, there are things that he and the other eye specialists really haven't even figured out yet. And this is exactly a great parallel coming back to Jason Zink and his co-creators with the mm -hmm. virtual visor. Yeah. Yeah, let's get back to our main topic. Um, so we learned how they come up with the idea and that they build some intelligence into the product, which is pretty cool. But I guess, well, the question that still remains is what happened in between? How did they figure out how to do this? Yeah, it's really uh, a, a big project and you might wonder how to even get started. In the very beginning, you know, we, we really weren't familiar with even the camera technologies or the display technologies. And so really the, the way that we, we approached it was always in kind of an incremental fashion. So when we very first started, uh, Ryan actually found a, an old monitor that was in the recycle bin and we, we disassembled it. True engineers. And took out that backlight and took out the back of, of the display and started, you know, we did it safely, but we powered it on and, you know, we, we put either a white image or a black image on the on the display and you could see whether it was either opaque or transparent. And um, that was kind of our first proof of concept. <laughs> That's so cool. Imagine that. These, uh, these fine gentlemen are working in the powertrain systems division of Bosch. So the normal area of focus is on a totally different set of technologies. But they have this step-by-step -step approach and they make continually good progress. And for the next version of the prototype, they use the little windows from welder's masks. A welder's mask. This is the, these, these helmet thingies, right? Those, but those have LCD elements as well? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, 
they are turning dark when the mask is sensing a bright light in front of it. Okay, got it. So then, yeah, this is indeed one step closer to what the virtual visor was supposed to do. Block the bright light of the sun when necessary. Uh, that was that was actually also something that they needed to research. When, and most importantly, how do people use the traditional sun visor? And what what we found was actually, I would say, really interesting. Regardless of what type of visor they had or what type of vehicle they had, it was always modified or, or adjusted so that there was always a shadow that came to just below the, the driver's eyes. And that's because nobody wants to block their view. So if you put your sun visor all the way down, you know, the shadow would come all the way down your face, mm -hmm. but then you can't see anything. It seems so obvious when, when he's saying it like that. Um, but I guess it's, it's one of the things that you have to really understand and internalize when you're working on a product like this. User research. Yeah, for sure. Because using the sun visor that way is something that we're all doing intuitively, but you never really consider it. Mm -hmm. because why would you? Yeah. Uh, but, but really understanding this, this, this specific idea and user experience was really quite a breakthrough for the project. Oh really? Why was why was that? In what way? Well, well, going into it, they they originally thought the virtual visor needed two cameras. Uh, we we already talked about the camera that's looking at the driver's face and mm -hmm. uh, ha analyzing how the light is reflected from it. And the original idea was that there would be a second camera looking in the other direction, tracking the light sources and calculating from which angles the light is coming in. Yeah. So oh, I was, I, I thought that's how how it works. Is not well. That that was my first assumption as well, um, and and even Jason and his team thought that would be the the natural way to handle it. Mm -hmm. But seeing the shadows on people's faces, they actually realized that they were making it too complicated. Mm -hmm. We recognize that you actually can figure out exactly where the sun is coming in, if you know what the setting on the visor is, and where the shadows are that are cast onto the the driver's face. So if you know. Uh, say you're you're blocking, say one one part of the visor, and you see that shadow on the driver's face. You can actually work backwards and figure out where the light's coming into the vehicle. So you can only use one camera that's looking at the driver, and you use it to track not only their head position, but also the shadows that are cast on their face. Yeah, that's really really a clever approach to the problem. Make it even easier. Yeah. So the visor basically knows there is a face. And where there's a face, there's this shadow on the face. And I'm here and I'm creating this shadow. So the light source must be in that direction. Exactly. Got it. But still, I mean, why is, why is this a big step forward for the project? So instead of having two cameras, uh, we only have one. And then at the same time, that means half as much processing has to be done. Oh, okay. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a significant reduction in the amount of computation that's necessary. So it, it simplified the concept mm -hmm. and it made the whole thing much, much easier to understand. And, uh, you know, I guess there's certain times in a, a project where it just feels right that you're, you made a, a good discovery. Yeah. <laughs> Best feeling in the world. Yeah. It's almost like I can feel the aha moment. It's so satisfying. Yeah, the little light bulb <laughs> turns on. Well, and uh, I, I'm kind of inclined to say... Oh boy, here it comes. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a very well-deserved wow. <laughs> uh, but but to, to round out and finish the point, because the virtual visor only needs one camera, they can use the camera that's already been built into many car models and that they're already built exactly for monitoring the driver's faces. Oh, yeah. The, the cameras that analyze if, if you're tired. Right? Yeah. And, right. And yes. well, then the car uh, recommends you to, to make a rest, to stop. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they add that functionality to the camera that's already there, and that's just bringing added value to it. Ah, uh, sweet. There's one last thing, which I wanted to mention about this project. And we, we talked already about the iterative development process and mm -hmm. some of the successes around it. But of course, it's not always smooth sailing. Uh, and as they went through and improved their prototypes, of course, as we heard, sometimes they'd yeah. get stuck or build something that just simply didn't work. In those situations, they had something special up their sleeve. There were times when we would just try something out. And there was other times where, you know, with Bosch, you know, being such a big company and has resources, uh, you know, all over the world, we're able also to kind of 
call in expert help as, as we needed it. Actually, Bosch has a relatively large group of people working on displays, and there's also a huge research arm of Bosch as well. So even, even for things that may not be in production, they're, they're aware of all the state-of-the-art techniques and technologies. And I totally, totally feel that. As I said in the previous episode, I'm more than a little bit of a Bosch fanboy. <laughs> and this is one of those reasons I why. remember. I, yeah. I mean, there's, there's just, <laughs> what can I say? I, I own it. There's so many clever and dedicated people in the organization. It's fantastic. I mean, it's just great how all of these 400,000 people working for Bosch can just help each other out, right? So yeah, I mean, Jeff, without without taking too big of a risk here, um, I mean, you and I, we are smart too. Well, right? We're, you're smart. Let's, let's call it street smart. So, so come on. <laughs> I can work with that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> let's use our gray matter and think. What, what's something, I mean, we could also reinvent something, couldn't we? Like they did with the sun visor. What, what could we do? Uh, uh, I... I don't know, off the top of my head. Uh, one of the people that I asked at the top of the episode said the car seat, mm -hmm. maybe. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you already also talked about the massage function, et cetera, that car seats now have. So I don't know. That, that has been reinvented. Um, what about the, the air vents? Uh, maybe. Probably, <laughs> probably not the wheel. No, let's though. not reinvent the wheel. <laughs> no, let's not do that. <laughs> But, I mean, we could just ask our listeners, what do you think is ripe for innovation? What part of a car would you give an overhaul? And maybe you already have ideas how you would change it. Let us know. And if you like, just send us an email to contact at bosch.de. Now, you notice the DE part. That's contact with a K. K-O-N-T-A-K-T. <laughs> maybe I should have done yeah. that. Of <laughs> Deutsch, yeah, maybe, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should change that. Anyway, contact, contact at, at Bosch.de. Yeah, we're gonna put that in the show notes for sure. Maybe you'll uh, see your idea pop up in a future episode. Um, yeah. Well, I, I guess that's it for this episode, isn't it? We've been literally illuminating what light makes with us, didn't we? We know how light engineers use light to delight us. We learned what exactly happens in our eyes if we are dazzled. And we got to know a super cool new technology, reinventing the sun visor. So helping avoid accidents. That was quite a lot, I guess. Um, so all that's left for me to say is talk to you soon. And thanks a lot for listening. Oh, wait, wait, wait. One more thing. Um, what about the mirror on the sun visor? Wouldn't, wouldn't you miss that? No. No, I, the only thing that it's there for is holding my parking card. <laughs> I, would, I would definitely miss it. That's like the very last thing I do when getting off the car and having to enter the office building before work, for example, checking myself as if I still appear like to be super freaking tired. And, well, just, just checking my, my face if I'm ready for work. Uh, of course, uh, Jason and co. Have, have thought about that. When it is in its darkened state, it actually makes the entire visor similar to a mirror. It's not perfectly reflective, of course, but it's, it's certainly enough that you can see your face and you know be able to do what you have to do with the mirror. And that's invented for life. <laughs> that's invented for life. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast.